Hello ladies, it's me again. Uh, this is Brandy Hayes, uh, looking to come and do lesson number two for our study in the book of Ruth. And I'm so excited to continue on with this and hope you're all doing well. And uh, you know what? I just want to get us started with some prayer and we'll jump right in. So dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to learn from your living word, God. I mean, this is not an old book that we're reading. This is the living word of God, and it is alive and well and still at work, Lord, as you are in our lives. And we just thank you so much for this tiny book of Ruth and this amazing story of these people who really lived and what you did through their lives and, and how much um, this story really pertains to us. And so I ask, Lord, that you would continue to show us every little ounce of information that we can glean from this story and um, add to our lives and to, to use it as a way to constantly remember how much you love us in this wonderful story of redemption. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you are just alive and active and well through this study as well, that you are speaking through the this lesson that I've put together as just a human being, Lord, that you you take it beyond anything that I have done, Lord, and and just please speak to those that that have taken the time to listen and watch this, uh, and speak into their lives, Lord. We thank you so very much for the ultimate love that you have for us and what you have done for us in that love, and um, just be with us today as we do the study. We thank you so much in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, here we go. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Ruth, and we're still in chapter one. Um, this gospel according to Ruth, it's been subtitled The Romance of Redemption for a Good Reason. The book of Ruth is an incredibly powerful, and believe it or not, like I said last week, prophetic book about Jesus Christ and the redemption of his church, but also of God the Father and Israel, his bride. And the wonderful love story here in the life of Boaz and Ruth. Last time we looked at the introduction of the setting that was in verses one through five. And then we saw that there were these things taking place and some uh, just here at the beginning taking place as preparation for redemption. And God is in fact at work in Ruth's life to bring about a tremendous blessing. And she has no idea that what lies ahead of her is a life that is going to be super blessed, super, super blessed. And if she only had at her disposal, Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us. This is a great scripture to pray if you want to be blessed. And if only Ruth had had this verse, how comforting that would have been. A promise given by God. It is though that verse was already at work in Ruth's life. Born a Moabitess, she was condemned to fellowship with anyone from Israel. She was a pagan by worship and by culture. Though she's a beautiful young woman, she is of a location and of a region in a belief system that is far on the other end of the spectrum as you could possibly be from the Hebrew culture. She would be the least qualified to be one that from her blood and her genetic makeup would eventually produce through the genealogy of Mary, through Mary's bloodline, the Messiah, a woman who had no right at all, a woman who had no roots or inroads to the commonwealth of Israel. God was at work. And if you would have asked her at this point and stage in her life, young Ruth, what do you think is happening here? She probably would say, I don't think anything. How many of you would say that? How many of you would say, I don't think much really about my life and what's going on. I don't really see much happening. In fact, Ruth probably would have said, I just see a lot of chaos and a lot of trouble a lot of problems. I don't see this God that my father-in-law, Lemonlech, talked about, who is now dead, by the way. 
Elimelech dies. My husband is now dead. My brother-in-law who was married to Orpah is also dead. So all the men in our lives are dead. And Naomi, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and I, I just don't see God being here much at all with us. And the temptation for Ruth is the temptation that you and I go through. And that is, where is God in the midst of all of this? Does he even care? I'm going to pack up my bags and I'm going to head out of town. And you see, that's what Elimelech thought. In verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1, we were told of the famine in the land of Israel and in the town of Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. That in the house of bread, a famine had come. God had brought judgment to Israel. Why? Because Israel had strayed from God. God will do that to every nation that strays from his commands. It's because he loves. It's not because he's evil. It's not because he's angry or spiteful or hateful. It's because he is holy. And God sends judgment to Israel and there was a famine because of it. And many people were in dire need. So what did Elimelech do as a reminder? Rather than be the good Jewish father that he should have been. And say, you know what? I remember the oldest writings that we have in the book of Job. Job says, naked I came into the world and naked I go. But be blessed by the name of the Lord. You know, we're going to stay here and we're going to fight and write it out. We're born and raised in Bethlehem. We're going to stay in Bethlehem and we're going to ride this famine out because our nation has sinned and it has qualified for judgment. So we're going to stay and throw our lives into the merciful hands of God and ride it out. Nope. Unfortunately, Elimelech packs up and he goes down to greener pastures to a place called Moab, the easy way out. And that's one of the temptations that you and I have is to take the default mode, to jump from the crucible of tests or of trying and go to the easy path, taking the easy way out. Now let's not play any games. Jesus said that difficult and straight and narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life. That's not a popular thing to say, but if we're going to be honest about the message, then the gospel according to Ruth in the romance of redemption, we need to make this statement, which is the little or the title of this message, and that is return to where you belong. Finally, after 10 years, Naomi is going back. She's going to return where she belongs. They never should have left Judah. They never should have left Bethlehem. But because it was financially difficult and times were tough, they bailed out. And they went to greener pastures, to pagan pastures. But they didn't think about that. They didn't care about that. They went for what looked good. And so this is a tremendous story. We're really still at the point of preparation for redemption. Because we really haven't gotten much into Ruth yet. But she's coming. We'll end out the study today, just at the part where she gets into the story big time. So let's look again at chapter one now, and let's read verses six through 15. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? 
Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And I want to keep on reading, but I'm not gonna. That's for next week. Ruth will have this amazing moment, and it's one of the most cherished portions of the Bible. It's one of the dearest readings that a Hebrew family or a Jew could read in what's announced by Ruth next week. It's an amazing thing because she's a Moabitess, as we've mentioned. And through her came, if you're Jewish, one of the greatest prophets of all. Now, if you're a Christian, through Ruth came, not only one of the greatest prophets, the greatest prophet. In fact, greater than Moses. And in fact, fulfilling John chapter chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And also, verse 14 from chapter 1, and the Word became flesh and dealt among us, dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow, isn't that amazing? And if you would ask Ruth, hey Ruth, you got a clue what's going on? She'd say, I don't have a single clue at all. And many times we feel the same way. We try to figure everything out. We try to be so analytical about everything. We get in our heads, but God is in control. He is master of everything. And I know you may have your argument, issue, blunder, whatever it is, but God says, bring it to me. If you've got a mind that can think, I'll give you the answer. If you want to hear the answer, God says, I'll give it to you. But if you want to be stubborn and rebellious and illogical, God is just going to fold his arms and hopefully the world will deal its cards to you and on you to bring you to the point where you decide, I think I'll try God now. We all meet people who have no understanding that there is a purpose to their life, but there is a purpose. And if you would have asked these women in Ruth at this moment, if they understood what was going on, they wouldn't have been able to tell you. God was very much at work. What's going on in your life? God's at work. So the title of the message is, Return to Where You Belong. And maybe you as a Christian, you've erred in that place. You've walked away. Maybe you've slowly slipped away from that place once where you were with Jesus. Can you remember a time with Jesus where you were fired up in love with him? That there was a time when you had passion for him and you would lay at his feet. And you would say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Send me a work today. Send me to the children, a neighbor, whoever, Lord, I am ready. Here I am. Send me. Was there ever a time in your life where you could step back and say that I spent more time with Jesus than fill in the blank? Or I was used to or I was used by Jesus then, or Jesus was the beat of my heart. Now, the natural argument for you and I is to say, well, now I'm older. I have a family, and these things are no longer that top priority in my life. And this, honestly, is why I used to help with the youth groups for many years of my life in ministry, because I always felt like it was so important to let young people know when you have the extra time in life when you're not married and you don't have kids and you don't have the full-time job. That is the time to just grow your roots in God in the word. Because when you get out into the world and the problems of adult life come and and you do get married and, and that can be great and wonderful, but as we all know who are married, that brings extra things into life and that can bring extra problems and and, and stuff that we're not used to. And you start adding kids to the mix. It just gets that much harder. How much better it is to have already grown your roots so deep in in the word and in in the Lord that you can weather those storms and you can stay strong and faithful to God. So 
you may be that person who has gotten to that point in your life where you're saying, I have so many extra things in my life. God is sadly just really not that top priority anymore. Yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. I think I'm going to heaven for sure. And that's probably true. But God wants you to have that passion again. And you can have a passion for him. Or you can, or, let <laughs> me reword that. And can you have a passion for him, but not be walking with him? Naomi was a good Jewish woman. And if you would ask her if she believed in the God of heaven, she would have said, absolutely. But she was living in a pagan foreign land. But she's going to be called to return to where she belongs. And what we need to ask ourselves if, as Christians is, is our relation with him so sleepy and so dead that it really doesn't matter? You know, if we miss church for a month, does it really make a difference in our lives? If we stopped Bible reading, would it really matter? It matters, and you know that. And so the first thing we want to see in going back to where we belong is the example of repentance that comes from Naomi. If you're a note taker, mark that one down. Before we can return to where we belong, we must repent. Now, a gentleman by the name of George Barnett took a poll, and in that poll, it indicated that the word repent, this is so awful, <laughs> is the least liked word heard in churches. You know what the top four least liked words in churches were? So number one, repent, sin, hell, and money. Well, isn't it interesting that the first one, that first word, the very first one that is the most hated by con congregations to hear about is repent. Repent is literally the first part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent. Ask for Jesus to forgive you of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. Repentance is huge. The first part or first word in the gospel isn't about sin or hell or money. It's repent. And you're not going to read about repentance in this story because it's in the heart of Naomi. Look what it says in verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return. Return from where? From the land of Moab. The beautiful, well-watered lawns of Moab. They had left Bethlehem 10 years ago to go hang out in this Palm Springs in the desert. For she had heard, and listen, it came to her ears. She heard rumors. Someone was talking in the marketplace. Guess what, you guys? The God of Israel has visited his people. His blessing is poured out in the land of Israel. She heard about it. That's the grace of God. Of course, I'm just making that up. I mean, it's a creation of my imagination, but somehow she heard. Wherever she went, whatever day that was, she heard that there was an outpouring of, of one of the gods or the God that the Hebrews believed in back up there in Judah. Yeah, there's a blessing going on in Bethlehem. I'm from Bethlehem. I moved from Bethlehem 10 years ago to here. It's nice here in Moab. It's comfortable. It's very affluent. But when I got here, I eventually lost my husband and my sons. They all died. And God is pouring out his spirit in Bethlehem? She turns to Ruth and Orpah and says, Sweethearts, you know what? Listen, stay here with your moms. Go back to the homes of your moms and dads. I'm going back to Bethlehem. I'm going back to where I belong. Gals, you're Moabites. You might, you wouldn't be received well in my land anyway. It's a cultural thing. And Moses warned us about it. And in fact, my first husband, or my only husband, Emelimelech, disobeyed God by bringing us here in the first place. But don't cry none of that. You just go on your own way now, girls. You're young. Perhaps you can find a new husband and rest in their arms in their homes. I'm going back to Bethlehem where I belong. You see, this woman was a Jew and promises had been given to her. 
Following her husband, who made an ungodly decision, Elimelech led her away with those boys. And you pick up any Jewish scholar or any Jewish commentary and turn to this passage in scripture, and they will tell you, according to Jewish history and tradition, what they believed was that God judged Elimelech by removing the life from his two sons for disobedience. And you might say that that's, that sounds like a mean thing. What an awful thing. It's not a mean thing at all when God is trying to get your attention because eternity is at stake. We get caught up in so many things that everything just lives past the tip of our nose. But there's more, there's more than that. There's much more than that. We so much live for the instantaneous, the now thing, the right now. If we can't have it now, we don't want it at all. You ever been to that place? It's like the story I heard of this Christian man and he kind of thought a lot of himself, you know, he was a big deal. And he was at some fancy restaurant that was busy. And he asked the, the gal up front taking reservations how long it would be for him to get a table. And she said, oh, it'll be about 25 minutes. And he said, I don't want to wait 25 minutes. Is there anything you can do for me? And she said, I'm sorry, no, it'll be 25 minutes. He pulled out his cell phone in front of her and and he called the restaurant down the street and asked how they could help him. Could they get him in right now? And they told him that they'd make a spot for him. So he snapped that phone shut and walked out of there. That was a bad witness. What's wrong with us sometimes? I mean, I, honestly, I can think of several moments where I've seen things like that happen. God's at work in your life. And you know... If you call the church because you have a problem, you know what we think or what we should think anyway. You got a problem. God is at work. And don't think that for a moment the church is supposed to remove the problem or your friend or another loved one that you confide in. Gosh, Brandy, you sound mean and cruel. No, it's, it's just that the church has been designed to help you walk through that problem because God is going to teach you that there's something in it. He's the one doing the work in you. He was doing a work in Naomi's life and he was leading her to return to where she belonged. Verse seven said, so she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. If you're a Jew listening to your name and, or I'm sorry, let me repeat that. If you're a Jew listening and your name is Judy or Jude, that word, all those words mean praise. That's what Judah means. Paul says in Romans 2, 28 through 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. To be a Jew is to be a praiser. Theologically, we are sons of Abraham. Who was the first? The first Jew. But he was a Gentile before he became a Jew. Did you know that? Israel's first leader was a Gentile. Now don't tell them that. It doesn't go over very well. <laughs> But Father Abraham was a Gentile called out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was a pagan worshiper and God laid his hand on him and God brought him out and made him the first Jew. What qualified Abraham as a Jew was that he was a praiser of God. Well, then I'm a Jew. My circumcision, my circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. And if you worship God and God is a wonderful living passion of yours, then you are Jewish in your worship. Now, you may wonder, why is it when we give our hearts to Christ, kind of all of a sudden, we start to like Jewish things? Did you ever notice that? It happened to me. I mean, personally, I've got pictures of Jerusalem in my house. All my boys have these giant Israel flags in their rooms. Actually, when I bought them, I thought they were going to be smaller, but they're like the full-on size, but we hung them up. They're in their rooms. They're awesome. 
I have jewelry with the Star of David on them. I have a Christmas tree ornament with the Star of David that I got in Israel because I just like knowing these things. They remind me of, of Jewish things and of Israel and of the Lord God. I just like them. Just like when you ever get a chance to go to Israel, you'll be like, I like it. I like it here. So many people have, have talked about how it just feels like home. I mean, we weren't born there, but it feels like home. And she's going home, just like Naomi remembers and likes it. She's going back to where she belongs. What about you and me? Are you kind of living this Christian thing a little bit here, a little bit there? Well, it's time to come back. God loves you and he cares for you. There's no reason to live in Moab anymore. If you're a Christian, I'm talking to you. Have you been cheating somehow at work with numbers or money? Maybe with the time you give or don't give in the quality of work. Are you cheating within your marriage or even just thinking about it? Cheating your kids and not pointing them to the Lord and by being the example that we're called to be. Any number of things I could bring up, it's time to come home. You see, the Lord loves you so much, he's chasing you. Nobody will pursue you like the Lord will. The Lord was chasing those in the land of Judah, and now they have repented. Boaz, by the way, at this time, he's living in the land, and we'll get to him pretty soon. God was starting to work again, and God was starting to flex his muscle. Have you ever seen God flex his muscles? When he does, mountains move. So Naomi's heading back home, and it's been 10 long years without a synagogue, without a worship place. She's going home. And it's a beautiful picture of repentance. And repentance is the answer to Naomi's problems. And repentance is the answer to our problems. If you want to live godly, if you want to have God bless your life, if you walk, you walk after him, and whatever is artificially there propping you up and trying to inflate your life to make it have meaning, get rid of it and depend upon God, not the martini at the end of the day. Depend upon God, not the fun flirting you get when you see that married guy at your workplace or whatever it is that may be going on in life. Depend upon God and he'll bless you and he'll lead you back into the land and he'll take care of you you see the thing is will we follow him in verse 6 the word return by the way it means to return back from where you've come from to go back to the starting place jesus said it is uh, said it to us in this way in revelation 2 verse 5 therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. That means repent and go back to your first works. Remember when you were a new Christian? You wouldn't shut up about Jesus. He was everything. People thought you were nuts maybe, even your family. I'm blessed that I was born in a Christian home and I've known the Lord as far back as I can remember. But I've seen those who have come to the Lord later in life. And it's inspiring to remember to be that way. God changes hearts. And God changes things in your life. Return back to that starting point where you couldn't stop talking about what had taken place in your life. Are we in love with him? Naomi had to be getting excited, I'm sure. And the situation was so tough that it brought her to the point of the decision to go back home and listen carefully, you might say, well, that's not much of a decision. She heard that there was a blessing in Bethlehem, so she's just gonna go back up to Bethlehem. Whoop-de-doo. <laughs> hey, listen, the Bible says, it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. Did you know that? Here's a moment to privately and truthfully check your heart. How many of you are doing okay? The goodness of God will lead you to repentance. Romans 2.4 tells us that. Have you had good things happen in your life? God has blessed you. I don't believe in God. Well, first of all, eventually you will. 
And second of all, this is an amazing thing. He blesses you even though you don't care a thing for him. Believe me, he takes care of you. He's not some kind of perverse creator who neglects his creations if they believe in him or not. Love him or not, he takes care of them. He knit every single one of you together in your mother's womb. He knew you before he created this world. You are a big deal to him. You are important to him. He always loves us first before we can even decide to love him back or not. And you know what's interesting? If you go around the world and ask people if they could ask God one question, you get mostly the same question. If there is a God who supposedly loves me, why is there so much evil in the world? They answer, men. And I mean men and women, okay, just so you know. <laughs> why did God create us if he knew everything was just going to go cockeyed? The answer, because he loves you. What kind of stupid thing is that? Who would create a system that would go wrong from the beginning? Yeah, well, that's because he gave us choice. Well, I'm going to choose not to believe in this. Then don't ever complain about how sick the world is. Because if you want to change the world, you don't create the Soviet Union or China or Cuba or communism to try to control people. You want to control the people? You let them loose and you give them the gospel. And God can come in and change hearts and nations Happy is a nation whose God is the Lord, says the Bible. Push God out of a nation, you're ripening it for judgment. And don't think for a moment America will not be judged. Our day is coming, and I believe it's begun. It is coming. It will come fast. God always goes after the gods, little g, that the nation worships. And who's our God as Americans? In fact, our God lies to us. Our God is green. It's about seven inches long and about three and a half inches tall and paper thin. And it says in God we trust. It should actually say in this buck we trust. It's amazing how many have lost money in this COVID crisis. And some may have been billionaires. But what's some lost money to a billionaire? Well, what about somebody who has $2,000 in their bank and they lost $2,000. These are warning signs, people. When your God dies, the little G, that little God dies, you die. See, the good thing about our God is he'll never die. So Naomi's going home and it's a story of repentance. In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, the Bible says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents over than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In Luke 15, 10 says, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus himself is saying, angels party when one sinner comes home. He says, in fact, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of the sons said, Father, give me my inheritance, please. I'm ready. I'm just ready to do this adult thing on my own now. So the father divided it up and gave the son his inheritance. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and journeyed to a land far away, maybe Moab. And there he wasted his possessions on prodigal living. But when he spent all he had, a great famine arose in that land. He began to be wanting, even to the point of wanting to eat what he saw pigs were eating, and nobody gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he thought, how many of my father's hired servants eat better than I do now? They eat bread and have some to spare. I perish of hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a servant like those that you have. So he arose and went back home to his father's house. But he would, when he was still far off in the distance, a lot of y'all know this, the father saw his son and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and said to him, 
sun. I mean, the first thing, sun. But the sun got out of his mouth next. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And then the father said to his servant, number one, bring out the best robe I have and put it on my boy. Number two, bring out my ring and put it on his finger. Number three, put my sandals on his feet. And number four, get the biggest, fattest cow we've got on the farm and prepare it for a barbecue. Because my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. It's time to be merry. And isn't that funny? His son wasn't dead, but he was as good as dead. It was time for him to come back home. So think about this. What about an outreach to those who don't go to church? What about those that have a billion reasons they can't go to church anymore? Reasons that even started before COVID became a part of the equation. What about those that are sitting at home and the Holy Spirit is saying to them, why don't you get up and go to church? Have you ever heard the Holy Spirit say, you know what, I want you to do this thing or that thing. Whatever it might be, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. Listen. The prodigal son was home because his heart was repenting. It was broken already, and repentance isn't even in the story, really. The action is, and that's the same with Naomi. Her heart was repentful, and she was heading back home. She even says it there in verse 13. She says, it grieves me for your sakes that the Lord is going to go against me. Listen, some people, some of you, Maybe you have a child, and I'm not talking about a baby. I'm talking about an older child, that even though he or she is older, still your baby, but you may say, my child won't listen to a word I say, doesn't obey a word I, I say, comes in at the wee hours of the night, doesn't respect the home, sets a bad example for the younger siblings. I don't know what to do about it. Won't take care of their responsibilities or worse. What do we do? You say to them, Junior or Little Miss, you're going to go to church on Sundays and on youth group days. And you don't, or, or else you don't eat here. You listen to your mom and you listen to your dad. Or there's not going to be a roof over your head in this house. I have other younger sons and daughters and they're watching you and how I deal with you. And if I'm going to lose you, I'll make sure that you're the only one I lose. But I won't let you take this family down. I love you so much, I'm putting my foot down. And the moment you cross out that door, I love you so much that until you repent, I'm changing the locks on this door. You're not going to eat here anymore. You're not going to live in your riotous way. If you walk out, know this. That door is always open if you come back with a heart of repentance. But if you want to come back here and turn this house upside down and be in control of this home and bring in your heresy or your horrible way of living, it will not happen while I live. And you know that that son or daughter will probably go out. And I've seen it personally happen. They'll call you on it. And they'll pack their bags and they'll head out. And sometimes it takes three hours and sometimes it takes three months. But they come back different. And if you think that's mean, you know what? To give them money to do their drugs, to play their game, you are only contributing to their demise. And you think it's love. Would it have been love if God would have said, Naomi, just stay there, it's okay. It's just a bunch of pagan worship and horrible things going on. You'll never have any direction in your life, never have any hope, but you can just stay there. That's easy. That would have been the ultimate tragedy. But that's not what happened. God intervened and Naomi listened. Verse 7 through 15. So she departed from the place where she was, her and her daughters-in-law, and they went to the way of Judah, the place of praise and worship. And they were on their way, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. 
you've dealt kindly with the dead and you've dealt kindly with me. So that's great. Thank you very much. Let's let you girls stay among your people. May the Lord grant you that you find rest each in your house, the house of her husband. In other words, you girls are young enough to go get another husband. Find rest. And then she kissed them. A kiss of farewell, by the way. They lifted up their voices and wept. Have you ever seen three women weep? They said to her, verse 10, listen, no, we are going to return to your people. They both said it, didn't they? Orpah and Ruth both said to Naomi, we're going to go back with you. I'm sure they meant it. And a lot of tears were between them. Have you seen something like that? It reminds me of two foreign exchange students that I knew uh, here in Anacortes a few years back. Funny enough, both girls, being the only two German foreign exchange students at the high school, admitted that they didn't like each other at first. But over the school year and the fact that they had both attended the same church and youth group, they became close friends. And when their school year was over and it was time for them both to go home, they clung to each other. I mean, I watched this with my own eyes and I mean, they didn't live close to each other in Germany. So they knew, even though they were both going back to Germany, they weren't gonna get to see each other that easily. And so they would start to let go and then they would grab each other again do you have my email? You have my email? Yes, yes, okay, okay. So make sure to call as soon as you get home, okay? Yes, yes, I will, okay, okay, with you know tears on their cheeks. They loved each other, and it became a long, drawn-out goodbye. And this was our girls here in chapter one. They were a little family being torn apart. They've been through a lot of grief together. In verse 11, Naomi says, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? There's no sons in my womb. Just turn back. Verse 12, she says, go your way. I'm too old. Verse 13, will you wait even if I had sons in my belly? If I gave birth to them today, would you wait? No, no, my daughters, for it grieves me very much, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and that was the final kiss of farewell from her. She turned and went away, but Ruth clung to Naomi. And the word clung in Hebrew can be used as an appendage. Another appendage was added to Naomi's life. Normally, you and I have 10 appendages on our hands, five each, right? The word here means that Ruth became another finger to Naomi. In other words, to get Ruth off Naomi, you would have had to separate them by surgical means. Their hearts had been melted together and were inseparable. And look at, oh, I love Naomi's heart here. Naomi said, look, Orpah, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after her. Return after your sister-in-law. And I love that because you see, if Brandy can talk you into something, then Bob can talk you out of it. Naomi is, is saying, listen, sweetheart, there goes your sister-in-law. You better go, Shu, go on. You're young enough, go on. And like me, a lot of times, I kind of have that personality where I want to please people. And so I, a lot of times I might say what I think the other person wants to say, but inside I'm, I'm kind of yelling out loud what I really want. So she's telling Ruth once more, and more than once to just go. But she's probably crying inside, please don't go, stay with me, I need you. But she's trying to do what's best for Ruth by telling her to go back. It will be hard as a Moabitess to live in Bethlehem. And we have to understand that the Moabitesses, you know, like we've talked about, they, they worship different gods. I mean, even their national god was called Chemosh. And you can look that up in Numbers 21, 29, 1 Kings 11, 7, verse 7 and 33. Chemosh accepted human sacrifices. That's 2 Kings 3, 26 and 27. I mean, that was some heavy paganism there. And that's what Orpah and Ruth both grew up with. But it is astonishing that Ruth feels distinctively different. Naomi is returning home, 
and Ruth is clinging to her. And next week is one of the most passionate, glorifying declarations of how the heart should be like towards God that you will ever find in the Bible. And it's going to be our prayer next week that that heart becomes our heart. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much as